In today's episode, we have a fascinating discussion with Lynn Testa from touringplans.com. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing that was all started by a mouse. You are listening to the Main Street Magic Podcast with your hosts, Jeremy Stein and John Marone. Hello and welcome to another episode of Main Street Magic. I am your host, Jeremy Stein, and I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, John Marone. Hello. In today's episode, we are joined by a very special guest, and that's Touring Plans, Lynn Testa. Lynn is the co-author of the unofficial guides to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Line, and Washington, D.C. He's also the founder of touringplans.com, an online trip planning website for Disney and Universal Vacations. Hey, man, welcome to the show. How's it going, Jeremy? Hey, John. Hey, Len. Um, When Jeremy and I started this, I think one of the first things in our mind, if we were ever to have guests, was can we get Len from Touring Plans? Oh, that's awesome. And here's the reason why. So I've been going to Disney since it opened. So I grew up in Chicago, go twice a year for eight, nine days at a time with my parents over Christmas and then also over um, Easter break. Wasn't spring break back then. Moved to Florida in 82, was able to increase the number of times that I go, especially once I was able to drive, move closer. So I've been hundreds of times. Yeah. Finally went to Disneyland, must have been about 96, 97 for the first time. And I've been there maybe five times. So we actually just went this past year in June. So it was, um, I have young twins who turned seven yesterday, and then I have a daughter who's 22 and a son who's 19. He had graduated high school. That's what he wanted to do. And then my wife as well. Wait, 22, 19, and seven? There's a story there, but. There is a story there. That's a whole nother podcast, apparently. (laughs) Yeah. So the, um, so we went, just not being as comfortable with Disneyland, I look for what can I use to help me? And I've seen posts by touring plans. Um, listen to some of the podcasts so, and have read the unofficial guide over the past. So I bought the unofficial guide to download and then said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and subscribe to Touring Plans and I'll do both Disneyland and Magic Kingdom. Though I'm not sure what this can offer me as a person who's been there so much. What do you? How are you going to save me time? I think I know a lot of the, you know, the, the shortcuts and different things. But it, I really used it to help with Disneyland. Um it worked wonderful. I had told Jeremy about it and said, you know what, let's start trying some of these at the Magic Kingdom, Animal Kingdom, you know, anything with Disney World and worked wonderful. So even for somebody, I, I think it's an invaluable service for somebody who's trying to just do the parks for the first time. But then you take somebody who's experienced and it, it's worked wonderful. So I, yeah, I so. great, great, I mean, great business, great company, great uh you know, just everything there really is helpful to us. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Yeah, Disneyland. We have a uh, uh, you know all the credit goes to our our guy there. His his name is actually Guy. Oh, nice. <laughs> that works. Guy's our guy in Disneyland. His uh, his job is actually to be in Disneyland every day. Oh wow! And so because Disneyland is uh is you know mecca for a lot of Disney fans, it's important to understand every nuance of that of that park in detail. I mean, it's got a ton of attractions, a ton of like, you know, interesting diversions, you know, things like that, park trivia, history, stuff like that. Um, and Guy is there to make sure that all of that stuff gets gets captured. He, um, he also does uh, interesting things like if the posted wait time looks different than what the line looks like, he will actually jump in line to make sure that our estimates are accurate. Yeah. So let's say the posted wait time says, you know, says it's 10 minutes long, but the line looks like it's an hour. He'll get in line to time it. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's part of what we do for, for, uh, for people in the, in that park. And, uh, we have so many people in Disney world that we get the same effect just by having, uh, when so many customers in Disney world every day, um, you know, sending us wait times too. So it's, it's really interesting. It's a great little community we've got. We've, we've developed them. I'm super proud and uh, and thankful for all of it. Good. Well, I have some questions on those wait times, but tell me. So let's start off. Just your background, your background for Disney, growing up. Just kind of, you know, what led you to to this point? Dude, it's, it's almost exactly like you. Uh, growing up, uh, my grandparents moved 
to Florida in the early 70s. They took me on my first trip, I think in 74, uh, which I, you know, was, I was super young, so I only remember parts of it. But um, I remember being in Pirates of the Caribbean, looking at Pirates of the Caribbean and just being super impressed with the idea that someone decided to build a replica, you know, fort slash cave in a, in a theme park that was that big. And I fell in love with it. Um, then my family moved to Florida in 80. Uh, so my, so we went to high school there. Um, my, I have a twin sister. We, we went all the time, um, you know, as young adults. Then when we, we both moved to North Carolina, we would think nothing of getting in the car at 5 PM on a Friday, driving all night to, to Disney world, playing all weekend and then driving back in time to be at work Monday morning. Yeah. I mean, it's just what we did. Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, in fact, one of those trips I was, um, one of those trips I was, I had just finished my undergrad degree and I was getting ready to start graduate school in computer science. And, um, and so this is the famous story of how touring plans began, but, uh, I was waiting in line for a great movie ride for two hours, which a, who waits in line for a great movie ride for two hours, but I was young, right? I mean, this was the early mid nineties, whatever. It's, these things happen. It's yeah. still questionable. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah, right. <laughs> but I got the I got the idea then for a computer program that uh, would tell you basically how to um, how to tour the park to avoid long waits in the line. And I thought, you know, if a computer had all of this information about, you know, when lines grew and when they uh, when they shrank and stuff like that, and basically park attendance information, if a computer could have that, it would make the best possible decision for you. So I went back to my um, my thesis advisors. Uh, and, and told them what I wanted to do for my thesis, for my master's thesis in computer science. And they, uh, so they had two questions for me. The first question was, uh, is it hard? Is it a hard problem? And the second problem, uh, a second question was, does anyone besides you care about this? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, is it, is it sufficiently difficult for a thesis and, and is, it, is it notable? So it turns out it's actually a, a, uh, one of the fundamental problems of computer science is uh, it's this thing called the traveling salesman problem. Um, and you can envision it as trying to minimize your weight in the line at, at, at Disney World. It's 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 sort of an instance of this traveling salesman problem thing. So uh, definitely super hard. Uh, it turns out millions of people actually care about that kind of thing. Um, so I answered both questions positively. So that the 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 thing that I did for my thesis actually became the business of touringplans.com. But yeah, that, I mean that's great. So early on then. How are you able, because Disney, right, they don't post attendance. You see wait oh. times. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do, story, how do you start? This story doesn't enough play. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I recruited my family. They were the original data collectors. And we would go down for like a week at a time at different times of the year. So basically my, my entire family would spend all of their vacations going to Disney World. And it was kind of ingenious the way we did it. So we originally we just focused on the Magic Kingdom because we figured that was the most complex park. And if we could figure that out, then the then the other parks would, would be easier. And, and when we were doing this, there, there was still no Animal Kingdom. So we only had three parks to worry about. But what we did was this. We had a, a small handheld notebook custom made for us. So we basically came up with a temp template that we used at Kinko's. And uh, it had... Every line in it was a an attraction. Every column was a time of day. And we had divided the Magic Kingdom up into halves. And starting at Stitch's Great Escape, you would walk counterclockwise through all of Tomorrowland uh, and then up into what was then Mickey's Toontown Fair and then back through half of Fantasyland and write down the posted wait times at all of those attractions. And somebody else would start at Swiss Family Treehouse and go clockwise through Adventureland, into Frontierland, back up through Liberty Square, into the other half of Fantasyland. They would both walk down Main Street and get back to the original starting points within 30 minutes. And that's what that's how my family spent three or four years of its vacation. <laughs> that we would we would just do that every 30 minutes from park open to park close, trying to collect the uh, the data. And um, so a couple of interesting things. One, um, we realized within the first hour of doing this, that we were all going to die <laughs> <laughs> from doing this. And I think the first time we went was June and it was just, it was brutal. So what I, what I, what we originally started off doing was, um, so we had six people. So one person would take a turn and work for 30 minutes and then they would be off for an hour 
and then they would work again. And what we quickly figured out was that by far the best thing to do is have somebody just work all day, park open to close, and then have two days off. Yeah. So they could go play around. So that was uh, something that my sister, Christina, uh, came up with. But here was the other interesting thing. We were walking 20 to 25 miles a day in the parks. And it got to the point where, like, when my family members couldn't couldn't go, I would I would go to people that I knew or our friends, you know, who kind of knew what I was doing. And I would say, look, I will pay for your entire trip. I'll pay for the transportation. I'll pay for your tickets. I'll pay for whatever you want to eat in the parks. I don't care how much you want to eat. Whatever you want to do while you're in the parks and you're not working, I will pay for it. But you got to do this thing for me, you know, one one day out of every three. And I, I tell you right now, guys, uh, nobody came back after the first day. <laughs> nobody <laughs> yeah. after the trip. No one I can see that. did it again. Yeah. It was 25 miles a day in, in Florida is brutal. It's the amount of walking that you do is incredible. It, it got to the point where um, we, we, people would sign up and I would, I would give them two things. I would give them um, moleskin for their feet and their own bottle of Advil with their name on it. And I, and I got to say, like I say, when your employer gives you painkillers on the first day with your name on it, <laughs> yeah. You're in trouble. yeah, generally a sign that, you know, you've signed up for something intense, but yeah, but that's how we did it. I mean, just getting our, getting my family to walk through the park. And then I think around like 98 or 99, maybe 2000, um, uh, Fred Hazelton, our statistician, uh, mailed Bob and said, you know, I'm kind of interested in this stuff. So Fred and I have been working together 17 years. And so he's the, he's the longest tenured person that I've, uh, that I've known besides me and Bob that have, uh, that have done this. But what he basically we were doing at the, in the beginning was I was just entering all this data into Excel, you know, from the times that we were going and trying to figure out like how to scale crowds up, up and up and down. And Fred obviously made this much more professional because he's a statistician. It, amazing. Cause obviously wait times are a factor of not just attendance, but it's a factor oh, of, you, you know, the, the loads that a ride can take, how many, yeah. you know, how many vehicles, you know, if they add more vehicles, take some out. I mean, there's so many variables that kind of go into that. And that's one of the, I think one of the big contributions that we've made to the science of, you know, theme park management was, was exactly that, that we basically look at wait time as a proxy for every other variable that goes into running a theme park. So staffing levels, number of, number of, you know, boats on Pirates of the Caribbean, all that other stuff. Wait times are a, a proxy for that. If you look at the literature prior to like, let's say the year 2000, when we sort of popularized this approach, everybody that, that tried to model how to route your, your way through a theme park was including management decisions like that, you know, like, how many how many boats are running on the log flume ride? What's the you know what's the staffing level for the day? And, and so they're looking at it from a management perspective. And I think we were one of the first to look at it from a consumer perspective, where all you really care about is that wait time number, uh, and it, it does greatly simplify uh, things. Now, the, you could argue that the posted wait time is not real. You know that that, that Disney manipulates the the posted wait time for a variety of reasons, or it's inaccurate for other reasons, and that's true. But uh, I think it's better. It's the best approach that anybody has, and that's that's something that that the unofficial guide has has sort of um, pioneered. Prior to that, it was it was looking at it from management's perspective, but looking at it from the consumer or the guest perspective is is something that I think we invented. So one question there then. So obviously you're you're really geared towards your your company is geared towards the attendee. Have you been able to do things with the with the theme park organizations, whether it's Disney or not, to be able to help them with some of their modeling? You know, officially we have no relationship, uh, and the higher up you go in management, the less they like touring plans. Um, <laughs> unofficially, yeah, I mean, all the time we we share data. So whether it's our restaurant or hotel surveys, which we should talk about, um, or you know the wait time stuff, uh, we have. I think it's I think it's safe to say we have fans inside the Disney organization. In fact, I'll tell you this: uh, we sent Fred, our statistician, to this uh, conference in August. So, uh, so every year Disney does this uh, this data science and uh, statistics conference where they bring in vendors of machine learning pro uh, products and stats products like SAS and uh, other companies. And last year we asked if we could attend, and they said no. This year we just signed up for it. 
uh, and paid the you know, thousand dollars or whatever it was to attend. Um, and we sent our statistician Fred there, and it turns out he's actually got a fan club within Disney's data science organization. So people were, you know, asking you know, to talk to him and wanted his business cards and posing for selfies with him. And they, the interesting thing is, they said they love the work. And they've been trying to replicate parts of it for years, which I think is really nice. Um, but yeah, so uh, you know, the data science people kind of understand what we do. The hotel people definitely understand what we're trying to do. We share our restaurant survey results with Disney's food and beverage team, okay. so I know that they see that. So yeah. that you know, it's it's like you know, the higher up you go in management, the less they appreciate sort of the criticism. But I think that's that's not unique to Disney. Right. So like when I said. Uh, when I said the New York Times that you shouldn't pay to go to Disney's Hollywood Studios, that that got me banned from media events. But uh, but you know on a day to day basis, you know, the, the cast members sort of understand that. Yeah, and apparently the L.A. Times just went through it, right, with the movie reviews. And that's the that's the thing. So it's uh, Disney. Disney has a habit of doing this. It's, so it's it's us, um, Rich Greenfield, the um, the analyst that covers Disney. Uh, for BTIG uh, has been banned from uh, earnings calls because he questioned the strategy around ESPN a few years ago. The, uh, the LA Times is, is just the latest example of uh, Disney doing that. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's not the first time. It's not, you know, definitely won't be the last. Yeah. So one of the things you mentioned, and uh, I'll add my take on this, is you mentioned Disney kind of playing around with the wait times and. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a number of reasons for that, but my example for this was when we were at, out in Disneyland, um, my oldest son, my youngest son, and I wanted to ride the new Guardians of the Galaxy. We were there the mm. week that it opened. So oh, I, wow, just, okay. I just went and got fast passes for everybody and all, you know, wonderful, stick your ticket in, get it, get it back, um, you know, get your ticket back. Because the times, right, they were running five hours, they were nuts. Yeah, I went fine. ahead and did the same with my wife's ticket and my daughter's ticket, who neither of them wanted to ride it. So we wrote it. I I am not a fan of Tower of Terror, but I'll put this plug in for Guardians of the Galaxy. I think it's one of my favorites. And I know you wrote about how that thing was just ranking off the charts for people. Right? Highest rated attraction in Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I loved it, and yet I'm not really that Tower of Terror fan. So we finish and my wife's like, okay, get me my fast pass for Radiator Springs Racers. That's what I want to do. And I'm like, well, I got you the fast pass for Guardians. I can't, <laughs> I can't get you one for you there. Five hours. Yeah, so right. she said, well, okay. So we go up to Radiator Springs and the wait time is 75 posted. So I <laughs> flip open touring plans and you guys say 27 minutes. Okay. So I say, come on, let's get in line. It says 27 minutes. So that's that's brave of you, man. I, I would have probably second guessed myself or second guessed the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the because app, it was off by so much. And then I timed it, um, timed it for you, and it was 28. So you were only off by a minute. Now, that was, <laughs> right. that was a very <laughs> difficult 28 minutes for me because she thought it was going to be 75. 75 and yeah. I, and, you know, that was our last day there, and that was the one ride I knew she wanted a ride. Yeah. So I took heat for that, and I'm like, hey, no, we're progressing. We're doing, look, and, and we're fine. We're fine. Um, you know, me kind of just relaying it while she's not talking to me during it. So we got, you, you tweeted got this up. Out, didn't you? you I, tweeted this out, right? Yeah, probably did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, why? Why the big difference? Why? You know, it's 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 a way for them to manage demand, or to move people around the park the without actually flow. telling them why. Yeah. So, uh, so not a lot of people know this, but but here's how we know that they manipulate the wait times. Um, back when my Disney experience first came out, um, in the data feed for my Disney experience, there's a ton of information um, about the status of the rides. Some of it they actually display on the screen, but a lot of it is just internal data that. Um, was included in the feed maybe because some other app used it and Disney only wanted to have one feed for all of its park information. But anyway, in that feed was not only the posted wait time, but what Disney thought the actual wait time was for the ride, right? So from the time my Disney experience came out until late 2015, you could see if you knew how to look in the, at the data, um, the posted wait time and what the actual wait time was. So we were seeing instances of 
and this is true and generally on holidays where you know the posted wait time for space mountain would be you know 200 minutes or 250 minutes but the actual wait time according to disney was 40 minutes and and what they're doing there is they're it, it's a signal for you to go somewhere else in the park yeah and that's the way that they that's the way that they were managing um crowds within each land basically if you if you saw a wait of 240 minutes for Space Mountain, you would you would walk to the opposite end of the park, hopefully to you know Haunted Mansion or something like that, and and try and find uh, you know a ride with with uh, lower wait times. Every park does it, by the way. Every park does it. Okay. And the the other ways that uh, that Disney can can move people around is by putting live entertainment where they want you to go. Um, so you know if they bring Mickey Mouse out at the central hub and they walk him towards Liberty Square, that'll pull people towards Liberty Square. But it only works for so long because Mickey Mouse has to be visible. Yeah. You know, for stuff like that. And they can they can do marching bands and special events and whatnot. But um the 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 way that they move people around is basically by by inflating wait times. They don't do it as much anymore. Um I mean they'll do it they'll definitely do it during Christmas this year. But on a day to day basis they don't do it I don't think as much as they used to. So even that, of putting a character somewhere, obviously that's geared more towards Disneyland than Disney World, since Disney World, they're, you know, they're in set places, um, yeah. not roaming around. You know, it's not that unique thing where you turn a corner and here's just a character standing around. Um, right. So that obviously they do it more with, you know, just entertainment. But it, Disney World, to me, seems much more rigid, Disneyland much more fluid. Yeah, okay. it, it's true for a couple of reasons. One is, I mean, Disney World is so much bigger and requires so many more people to staff um, that they they have to run it like a machine or like a factory because otherwise everything breaks down. So it's it's one of the reasons why you can predict things uh, more regularly at Disney World and why the cast members' roles themselves are so narrowly focused because there are so many moving parts that if you if you let people make their own decisions, um, thing, things will break down. It's, it's, it's an interesting management philosophy. I used to not understand it. I understand it more now. Okay. Yeah. So Disney, sometimes you get in line, they would give you the little red card that would time yep. you through it. They stopped that. Did they stop that because of the data that they pick up from the bands now? They still use um, the flick cards, the little red cards, every once in a while. But yeah, they're um, from what I understand, they're moving more towards... Um, magic bands and the magic bands allow them to more accurately uh, or, or actually more quickly update the wait time in line so one of the problems with the flip card was this if you get in line at Space Mountain let's say at noon and they hand you a red card and you give it back to them at 1240 um, the wait at 1240 is not 40 minutes the right. wait was 40 minutes 40 minutes ago right right um, but now with magic bands they can sort of tell how you're progressing and how many other people are are getting in line, so the, uh, the theoretically the the wait time should be much more accurate. Um, they 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 still add a fudge factor to it, somewhere around fifteen to twenty percent um, for guest satisfaction reasons. So if the wait is forty, they'll tell you it's um, you know anywhere from forty five to fifty, and then when it really is forty, you think like you've got something for free. Yeah, <laughs> you're so happy. Um, so are you yeah, telling me Peter Pan really isn't that long of a wait? <laughs> it's Peter Pan isn't. So the 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 more popular rides though are fairly close. Like like when they say three hundred minutes of Pandora, I, I I think they actually mean three hundred minutes. Yeah. Right. Um, the other interesting thing is this: the like when Space Mountain breaks down, we noticed in, in our stats that the wait time for Buzz Lightyear obviously goes up because people aren't running Space Mountain, but it becomes much closer to the actual wait time. Or sorry, the actual wait time becomes much closer to the posted wait time. Okay. So you know, if if Disney's normally running uh, Buzz so that the actual wait time is eighty percent of the posted wait time, when Space Mountain breaks down, it's actually closer to one hundred percent of the posted wait time, yeah. which is super interesting to us. Yeah, yeah, that definitely is. So, but go back to that. Explain the fact, the, just the infatuation with Peter Pan ride. I mean, it, this it, is, yeah, this it, is a it, constant just, on our show. On this last week, <laughs> we, we, I mean, so we just talk. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, it, it's a great ride, but it's not a it's, it's not, a not not a headliner. But it, realistically, if you're not taking a fast pass for it, forget yeah. it, right? And unless it's just such off times, or you 
you do it during a specially ticketed event where it cuts down on it. But when you look at it, it's like, well, wait a minute. Okay, Mind Train's running 80. Peter Pan's running 60. They're, they're, it's just two Why? different levels of rides. And uh, I, I just always scratch my head on that one. You know, the ride system is unique for it. It's the, uh, I think it's the only ride um, that you're flying above things yeah. um, on it. I think that's part of the charm. I think the scene over London is charming. It's a dark ride. Everyone likes Peter Pan. Um, it, yeah, it's a, it's a, it, it is a charming ride. There's no other word for it. I think that's what drives the popularity on it. Yeah. The other thing is, is it's a, it's a relatively low capacity ride and that's what's, a, that's what's making the wait time high too. Right. Um, so answer me this. Um, just two quick questions on like fast pass. So what have mm-hmm. you noticed over the, with the times now that you can book three rides on fast pass 60 days ahead or whatever your, oh, your time yeah. frame is versus when you used to go to the machine and do paper or not, what, what have you noticed with those changes? This is really interesting. Um, so I'll tell you what Disney originally thought when they decided to move on Fast Pass Plus. We um, we managed to get a copy uh, of the business plan for Fast Pass Plus literally the day the board of directors saw it, <laughs> and it's a 120 page document that explains not only the rationale for why they needed to do Fast Pass Plus, but also how it was going to roll out. Um, and one of the interesting things that they said was this with Fast Pass Plus. They said that um, the number, the the average number of fast passes, paper fast passes that people used, was about one per day. Uh, so it wasn't getting a lot of use. But those people that used fast pass loved it. Uh, their satisfaction was much higher than people who didn't use fast pass. So Disney's idea was uh, in in going to fast pass plus. They you'll remember the original version you had to book three fast passes. Right. And the the decision of three came because they they saw that people who used one were were happy people who used two were happier so then disney thought well three three is the magic number right and it's and it's in the presentation but the interesting thing they said was this they said that their um, their industrial engineers estimated that when they added fast pass plus to all of the rides that the headliner ride wait times would go up by three to eight minutes on average. But that the overall guest satisfaction would increase so much that they were willing to live with that increased wait of three to eight minutes. And it turns out after they implemented FastPass Plus, headliner wait times went down by about three to eight minutes. Um, and the secondary rides wait times went went up. So they got it exactly wrong on on what they anticipated in terms of the effect of FastPass Plus. Um, but it, it, we, we all still consider it a success. Um, so, so here's what we see. Weights at the headliner rides with FastPass Plus are down. Weights at the secondary attractions are up. And, it, it, and the reason why is, I think, interesting from a user experience perspective. We think most people didn't know that you could get a fast pass for things like Dinosaur or Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, or, the, or these other sort of secondary rides. But once you saw the choices on a computer screen, it reminded you that you could do it. And so those became more popular and the wait times increased for it. So like Dinosaur, for example, Dinosaur's in the middle of nowhere in the Animal Kingdom, right? No one was walking over there to get a fast pass. But if you think about how the rides were originally listed in my Disney experience, the default order was alphabetical. So dinosaur was the first thing that you saw. And some more people got fast passes for dinosaur. So then staying on that for the fast pass, I, in my mind, I understand the tiering system. Not all the parks have it, but for the <laughs> ones who, the ones who do, but if, if yeah. I go, if I go on to whatever, I, I go to animal kingdom and I want to get a fast pass for flight of passage. I can't get one. Right. I, I don't yeah, care. Just... I'm 60 days out. If I'm seven Oh one, forget it. I'm not getting it. So yeah, I know yeah. the popular rides fill up and then the fast passes are gone. Yep. So why tier them? Because, if it's not there, it's not there. I'm just going to choose something else. Is it just that thing like, well, we want at least half, well, we want at least a third of our guests to do test track, at least a third to do Soren, at least a third to do Frozen. 
So at least there's some happiness there, and they could wait for the others as opposed to somebody taking all three and yeah, knocking somebody else out. That's exactly it. So they uh, they don't want people to uh, to ride Toy Story Mania three times in a row because um, the their incremental satisfaction from riding it three times would not be as great as the two people who are disappointed not being able to get the extra two fast passes. Um, and that's that's exactly it. And it, uh, the other thing is is like at a park at, at Hollywood Studios, um, they definitely want crowd distribution. So they want you to walk all the way over to Star Tours or Muppets. And they want you to walk all the way over to Rock and Roller Coaster, or, or in this case, Tower of Terror, because it's in the same, it's not in the same tier. Um, they want the crowd distribution there, so those are the two reasons for it. So that would explain why Beauty and the Beast is a tier one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes they throw it in there just, just to have more, um, more choices in tier one, because like for for Hollywood Studios, it's it's Toy Story, Fantasmic, Rock and Roller Coaster, and Beauty and the Beast, right? And it you can envision days where the first three of those sell out pretty quickly, but they can always add more Beauty and the Beast shows, right? I mean, they can start running them at 10 and run them every hour until the park closes. And that's enough fast pass capacity for tier one that, you know, you can always say you got something. Yeah. Interesting. So let's talk about your service in, in the fact that, you know, touring plans, the fact that you guys have it, it you charge for it. Why would Disney not look at it and say, you know what, we're not fans of touring plans. Sure, we are. They share data with us, but you know what? Let's wipe them out, and for ten bucks, we'll do our own. We'll create a touring plan for a guest on our own. <laughs> uh, what? Yeah. Uh, two reasons. One, it's it's not in their best interest to do that. Um for a couple of reasons. One is you would have to tell guests how long you're actually going to wait at a ride. Um, you know, cause, cause guests want to do things like, like plan meals and breaks and things like that. Right. So, um, when the posted wait times differ from the actual wait times by 20%, that's 12 minutes every hour. Right. So your, your plan would be off by half an hour by noon uh, if the park opened at nine and your park would be in your plan would be off by two hours by 9 PM. So Disney's Disney's there's no reason for Disney to ever tell you what the actual wait times are, right? They would have to do that in a touring plan. So they would basically have to tell you in the, in the actual touring plan, um, the difference between the posted wait time and what you're really going to wait. And there's no incentive for them to do that. The, okay. um, the second thing is, is, uh, is this, it's hard to do a touring plan. So my, my master's thesis expanded on the PhD dissertation of UPS's lead research scientist, uh, a woman named Chrissy Melandrake, who had studied this problem, uh, a lot. Uh, I will say that, uh, there are maybe 20 people in the world who are studying this problem. Uh, I think I'm in the top five of that, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting problem. It's very hard to solve. It's not like you can just, you know, hire, hire a programmer to look at it. Um, I mean, like I said, it's one of the fundamental problems of computer science. Uh, and unless you've studied it for a very long time, it would be difficult to, I think, understand it fully. Um, I mean, Disney's told us they've, 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 they've tried for years. They've been trying for years to, to, to do a touring plan and they can't come up with it. And I, I think that's why. And they've got, I know they've got PhDs working on it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult problem. The other, the other third thing is that, um, and this, we, we actually faced this early on. When you, when you give somebody a touring plan, you have to account for the fact that you've now sent someone to those attractions and you have to increment the wait time at those attractions to, yeah. to take it, take it into account. So, uh, so imagine you send, uh, you know, 40 people to Dumbo as soon as the park opens, you know, saying that the wait time is going to be zero minutes. Well, for the 40th person that gets there, the wait is definitely not zero minutes. The wait's going to be, you know, one ride cycle plus a little bit of time. And so one of the things we, we had to do early on was figure out, how to account for that. Cause now we've got, I mean, there are days when, when there are literally 500 families 
in the parks using touring plans. Um, and we can't send them all to Dumbo at the same time because that would be horrible. So we had to f- actually figure out a way to do that. And, and the way that we did that was this. Um, we, we said, you know, if we're sending you to Dumbo at noon um, and you're the first person that we're sending to Dumbo at noon, your wait time is going to be, you know, 40 minutes or whatever. Um, and we know the capacity of Dumbo is basically every other person we add is an incremental six seconds of wait time. So the second person that goes to Dumbo gets 40 minutes and six seconds. The third group that goes to Dumbo gets 40 minutes and 12 seconds for wait time. And basically, as they're, as they're updating their touring plans, we're adding and subtracting these incremental wait times to everyone in real time, which is a, I mean, imagine the complexity of that. Now, we've actually, we've actually tested this. Um, uh, so we run on Amazon's, you guys familiar with Amazon's cloud servers? Mm-hmm. Yes. We, um, we run on Amazon's cloud servers. And one of the, uh, the first, we, one of the things we did when we, when we implemented that was we actually had to go to Amazon and we said, look, we want to simulate 40,000 families in the park. And, and we need enough server capacity to run this analysis to make sure that the models work. And at the time, um, Amazon was only letting you use 20, 20 server instances at a time. So you actually had to write them and explain what you were doing. And the guys at Amazon were great. They, they, they got on the phone, you know, we had a, a, a five minute call and they were like, okay, what do you want to do? And they're like, we're trying to simulate, simulate crowds at Walt Disney World because we wrote this routing algorithm. And they, there was this, this pause for a second, like they were thinking about it. And then they said, that sounds cool. Okay. <laughs> and, they, and they let us do it. So we simulated, uh, um, this is back in like 2012, 2013. We simulated for an entire day the effect of sending 40,000 families throughout the Magic Kingdom. And the, the software worked. It scaled um, to that. So we, we figured it would do it. But that was, it's really hard to do all of that stuff. And I, I, I'm sure Disney could do it. Um, it's just, it's very complicated. Good. Yeah. Well, so. well, for the Disney fan community and Jeremy and I, you're not number five. You're number one in doing this. <laughs> yes. so, that, so, that is so, for sure. So thank you. Yeah, we've been living we, off touring plans this year. Now, part of that is because we don't know anybody else in the top uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. 20. But hey, hey it works. I know, I know who they are. They're, they're smart people. I think um, there, there's some things that we've learned in the last 20 years that still haven't been published. I'll say that and then leave it at that. I'm actually saving some of the stuff for my PhD dissertation. Oh, so. yeah. Very good. It's true. <laughs> one day, one day. One day. So um, you talked about people planning meals and, and even where to stay and everything. So let's talk about how <laughs> touring plans kind of works within that. Hotel ratings and reviews, restaurant ratings and yeah. reviews. One of, the, um, one of the things we do, we, so uh, millions of people visit the website every, every year, touring plans. And we, when they tell us that they're taking a trip, we send them a, a, a satisfaction survey, just like Disney does at the end of their trip. Um, and I don't know why. I think it's I think it's actually our community, but we get back hundreds of thousands of surveys every year. So so let me put this in perspective. Last year we got five hundred thousand attraction surveys, and we got one hundred and twenty three thousand restaurant surveys. So to put to put the restaurant surveys in perspective, that's more than Yelp and TripAdvisor have for Disney World combined over their entire lifetimes. That's we got incredible. that in we got we got that in one year. Man. Yeah. So, um, and I think it's, I think it's sort of the, the people that would use a service like touring plans are the exact same kind of people who are happy to fill out a super detailed survey. So it's kind of yeah. like a, a self-reinforcing loop there, but, um, but yeah, so we, we are able to spend to, to detail, I mean, to quantify the, the quality differences in, in every restaurant in Walt Disney world. And we, not only do we show that what the user rankings are, but we, we actually have a, a professional food critic who eats in every Disney restaurant every year. So we pair that um, the user ratings with an expert opinion. And we tell people you know, basically this, look, if the, if the restaurant rating from users is like 90% or above and our critic likes it, book it, right? You, mm-hmm. These are places like Jico, Boma, Sanaa, you know, California Grill. I mean, places that, are, that everyone agrees are good. If the restaurant rating is like below 80 and our food critic doesn't like it, then don't go because it's, it's bad, right? Your odds are you're not going to enjoy it. And this is places like Rainforest Cafe, um, SDK is not highly rated, uh, places like that. And then if it's in the middle, right? If it's one of those things where 
the users like it and the critic doesn't or the critic loves it and the people don't, then, then read the review, right? Read, what, read the reader comments and read what our critic has to say and decide if that's something that, that, that you want to try. So, uh, you know, the critic might say, the drinks are great, the appetizers are great, the entrees aren't worth the money, in which case, you know, you would go there and you would order appetizers and drinks and you wouldn't order entrees, right? Um, and and that's, that's something that I think no one else does. Certainly TripAdvisor and, and Yelp don't have experts that have eaten at every restaurant in Disney World. So we, we were able to combine both of those things um, into one. And, and I, I will say this, uh, the reason why you pay $15 a year is so we can afford to eat in every restaurant and do it. Uh, we're it's we're very happy expensive. to pay it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's very expensive to do that kind of stuff. It's very expensive to pay for statisticians, obviously, yeah. uh, for things like that. But that's where the money goes. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, you know, that that's very few people complain about the price. But it, uh, Yeah, not at all. I mean, I want to even say by buying the book, and getting both parks. I mean, I don't was, I was probably fifteen bucks for both, right? For Disneyland and Disney World. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think we have a, a tremendous discount for uh, for both of those. The other thing that I would say is this: if you just want to do a touring plan, the touring plans are free. Okay. Um, it's always it, the service has always been free. It's the other stuff, the crowd calendars and the restaurant reviews and whatnot that uh, that cost the money. So, but the touring plans we've always given away for free, sort of like a it's my personal mission to improve people's uh, times in parks. So, yeah. The uh, the other interesting thing we do with so we, obviously we do the same thing with hotels, in terms of surveys. Um, but the other interesting thing that we did that Disney actually had to cooperate with us on. Uh, have you guys seen the hotel room view? Yes. Feature. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, it's it's this it was this crazy project back in 2012. Bob Selinger and I were sitting at Pop Century, and sorry 2011 2011, and we were talking about the the number of emails that we were getting so bob always bob has always had this this um this rule that he or i answer every piece of email every piece of mail that comes to the unofficial guide the authors would would respond to yeah and that was fine when you know before before the internet right when you might get 500 pieces of mail a year right people would write in letters in 2011 I think I answered 16,000 emails just related to the book. And I was telling Bob, I was like, I, I, I can't do this. I have a full-time job. I can't, I can't do this yeah. anymore. Right? I can't. So, um, so he said, well, well you know, what are the, what's, the, what's the thing that you're getting the most questions on? And I said, it's, it's hotel room questions. People want to know, you know, like, what's the best room to book at Port Orleans Riverside? And so we'd actually put in the book a couple of years before, we had put a list of, like, you know, the 10 best rooms at each hotel. And, and that wasn't enough, obviously, because those 10 rooms get booked up every day, right? No one's going to, you, you just can't book those rooms anymore, right? No one yeah. gets them. So, so we're sitting at, at, at Pop Century and we're looking at it, you know, because it's, you guys have stayed there, right? I mean, it's, it's a value resort. You can see the room numbers. Yeah. And so we get this idea where, and it was crazy, where we were going to take pictures of the view that you get from every single hotel room. <laughs> and put it online in a database and basically say, you know, if you want a quiet room, here are the quiet rooms. And, you know, we, we were going to do this database where we, we would tell you how quiet every room was and how far it was from the bus stops and how far it was to the restaurants. And, you know, you could figure out the walking times. And so we're like, and Bob, the, the great thing about it was Bob was like, okay, well, we can do all the database stuff, right? We can, we can tell you how quiet the rooms are. We can tell you how far it is to walk. You know, to everything, but how long is it going to take you to, to photograph, you know, 28,000 hotel rooms? Oh my God, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we call our photographer, uh, who is this guy named Richard, and we, uh, we're like, okay, there's 192 rooms per building in Pop Century. Photograph all 192 rooms. Tell me how long it's going to take. And so he, he's, he's like, you want to do what? I'm like, yeah, go do it. So we tell Disney what we're doing. And, you know, and Richard goes off and does it and he comes back. He's like, okay, it took an hour. I'm like, really? It took an hour for 192 rooms. And I'm doing the math in my, my head. And I'm like, okay, that means you could, you know, you could do all of Pop Century in a couple days. Yeah. Right? That means you could do all of Walt Disney World in a couple of months. Go do it. <laughs> so, we did, so, so we did. And the interesting thing was he said the, the hard part wasn't the photography. The two hard things were 
finding a reasonably clear day, you know, where it was sunny, mm -hmm. and then organizing the photos. So yeah. like, you know, when you take a photo, it's like IMG underscore, you know, right. one, two, three, four. Yeah, now you got to match those up to room numbers. To room numbers, yeah. exactly. And he did it by hand. Man. Uh, which was beautiful. But the other interesting thing was we, we needed two pieces of information from Disney. One, they actually need to let us into certain hotel rooms Yeah. Um, because we needed to get, we couldn't get all 28,000 hotel rooms, but we wanted to get samples like, you know, from each wing of each hotel or whatever to start with. Um, and Disney let us do that. And the other thing that they gave us was a spreadsheet for each hotel that said, here's the room number, here's the kind of room it is, and here's the view. So, you know, room one, two, three, four at Port Orleans is, you know, two queen beds, garden view. Yeah. And so we loaded that into the database. Um, and it took us, the, the thing that took us the longest was actually drawing the maps that showed every room on every floor of every building. That took a year Yeah. to get right. Um, but then we launched it, I think, in 2014. So basically it's this thing called the hotel room finder where you tell us the um, the kind of, uh, room you booked and we will uh, not only show you all of the rooms that match that criteria but if you find a room view that you like we will send a fax to Disney on your behalf five days before you check in um, with a request for that room or a similar room yeah so I, it's funny because I just wrote down while you've been talking about this room request because I did want to touch on that because um, I use it each each month that we go and I'll put in a room request and it may be based on being close to um, a pool or yeah, closer, maybe up to, you know, the front lobby. Uh, do you, do you track accuracy or what does it look like? What is the percentage of people that are making room requests and at least getting within that building or area? How does that look? So we consider, um, we consider success. Uh, if you get the exact room you requested or one of the secondary ones that, that we say are equivalent. Okay. So if you get the room next to it, we consider that a success. So the success rate is somewhere around 66 to 70% wow. on the room requests. Yeah. It, it obviously it drops during peak times. Sure. Um, because more people are competing for it. But but yeah, I mean in general, um, it's it's definitely better than better than an, uh, a coin flip. Yeah. And I think that's that's as good as you can get. The the two main reasons we hear from Disney um, th sorry, the three reasons that we hear from Disney from the room assigners where you can't get your room is uh, one, someone's already, already requested the room. Mm -hmm. um, two, if you, and this is interesting because I didn't know this, if you show up early and you ask uh, if your room is available, when you say, I'll take the first available room, that actually overrides every other request you will make. Okay. So the Disney front desk says, thinks, if you show up earlier than 3 p.m., you must really want to get in that room and you will take any room instead of what you requested. Does that include online check-in? And if you say, you know, because a lot of times we'll drive down in the morning and we're going to head straight to a park, but we'll do an online check-in because room's no, paid no, for, and we'll do 10 a.m. Okay, only if you actually no, show up if you, if, you, if you physically gotcha, show okay. up, they, they, mean, they, they take that to mean that you really need the hotel room right now for some reason. Gotcha, okay. And that overrides every other request. And yeah. the third thing is um, you're asking for a room that you didn't pay for. So you book a garden view you want theme park view and yeah. that that's what you make your and we actually tell people you know this is what you you know you're you're, you're asking for a room that you didn't book for it doesn't hurt to ask but make sure you have a backup plan and that's the uh, that's yeah. the third thing so okay. yeah, but the, well, the, the disney room centers are fantastic they do a great job um oh sorry i'll say i'll say this the fourth reason and this is my personal thing i've read a lot of room requests yeah, there are times when I literally don't understand what they're trying to trying to ask for, and that's um, that's difficult. So oh, I'm sure, yeah. So it's, it's sometimes the the requests go on for you know three paragraphs, and it, it's it's hard to understand what what is being requested there or what the priorities are. And I think sometimes that's the room centers just kind of throw up their hands and say, I don't know what to do here. But, yeah. Well, but I, yeah, I, I got my new room at Pop Century through a room request last time I was there, so it worked for me, so I was happy. Oh, good. I'm, gl I'm glad you're there. Yeah, it's, um, it works at DVC Resorts. It works, you know, uh, it works at a lot of places. The uh, I, I hear every once in a while, you know, I'll get an email that says, oh, you know, I read online that Disney doesn't honor room requests or that they throw them out or, you know, it's not it's not being done at this resort. And I'm like, you know, think for a minute about what you're saying. You're saying that 
a customer writes to Disney and the customer's paying thousands of dollars for the hotel room and Disney's just going to ignore the request. Like what, what possible business reason is there for that? <laughs> right. What, why would that be true? It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me, but yeah, I think the, uh, you know, in general, the room assigners do, do a fantastic job in getting people close to the rooms that they want. We, um, we actually send them gift baskets every month. So nice. every month I send, I send three Disney resorts, uh, Harry and David gift baskets. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of nice. Very yeah, nice. Very so, nice. So, yeah, you know. so two things. Talking about food real quick. So um, one, if your reviewer, your professional reviewer, eats at Bongo's or STK <laughs> and, and needs some time off, Jeremy and I will be happy to fill in. <laughs> yes. We consider ourselves foodies and uh, do it. Bongo's, do a really? There. Bongo's? Well, if your reviewer eats there. Yeah, definitely. I, have you eaten at Bongo's recently? No, it's terrible. Yeah, the best thing about Bongo's is the Cuban coffee. Uh, okay. you know, but, that, that's why I say. I mean, if your reviewer goes ahead and says, "Yep, I'm going to try Bongo's or I'm going to try STK," and for some reason they're they have some issues yeah, afterwards, not, not feeling too good for not, a few not, days. Yeah, not too yeah. good. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll fill in. Yeah. So, you you mentioned Sana. Sana ranks where on the chart as far as how oh, top five. So the interesting thing is. Um, Boma, Jiko, and Sana, I think, are all top five or six yeah. across all Disney World sit downs. So, in this edition of the Unofficial Guide, we actually said um, that the hotel itself ranks high enough that if if you like the animal theme or you think your kids would like the animal theme, and you have any interest at all in eating at your restaurant, just book the Animal Kingdom Lodge and and go on to the next step of your planning because that's that's literally all you need to know. I, um, I agree with all three of those restaurants. Love them all. But here's the thing that I say about Sanaa. Tell me what the number one thing is that people say about Sanaa. What do they like there the, the most? The bread service? Right. <laughs> there you go. Nobody has ever, I have never seen a comment from anybody about anything other than the bread service. <laughs> if I ask somebody, if Jeremy ate there, he tells me about the bread service, and I say, what would you have for your meal? You know, I don't remember. But I went back for the bread service night. the next night. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the, I mean, so I spend half of my time in, in Manhattan where there are literally two dozen good Indian restaurants within a four block radius mm -hmm. of my house. Uh, you know, is it, is it that good? No, but I think Indian food in general is underrepresented in Walt Disney world. Yeah. And, and I think that people, a lot of people like that. Plus it's so vegetarian friendly. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a good atmosphere. The service is good. Yeah. But the bread service is just is just fantastic. So one of my last questions is really, um, what's something that you kind of found or, or just going through data, anything that you think would just surprise the average person? And I know it's a very broad question, but. Wow. Um, wow that would surprise people. That's an interesting question. The, uh, all right. So it, it has to do with bus service. Um, you guys are taking this the bus. Yeah, I, I do my best to never take the bus. And and we've my family has started to because of John we've started to drive. <laughs> we both live close enough to Disney that when we go down we have our own personal vehicle. Yeah, your car. Um, yeah, yeah. So the only time we ever bus is usually now to Magic Kingdom because nobody wants to drive and and deal with you know TTC down there. So um, yeah, the, so this should be very interesting what you have to say about the buses. The 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 bus service is remarkably efficient. Yeah. Um, it's on average, you're across all the resorts. If you want to go to a park, your wait is going to be 16 minutes or less to get a bus. When, when, so when you think about how large uh, Disney World is, it's basically the size of a, a medium-sized city. Um, waiting 16 minutes for a bus is, is extremely efficient. The thing that we've noticed in our reader surveys is this. If you come from an area with good public transportation, you, you think that Disney's bus service is is remarkable. So if you're from New York or Boston or London, someplace with, you know, a subway system or, you know, where you use mass transit a lot, you tend to think, um, you know, Disney World is, is very good at what it does. If, you, um, if you've if you never used mass transit before, and, and for a lot of our readers, um, the Disney bus service is literally the first time they've ever been on pu public transportation or yeah. you know, quasi-public um, you think it's socialism incarnate. If you think it's the, the worst, you think it's, this is everything that's wrong with, this is why the government shouldn't run public transportation. 
Um, and it's true. It, we've we've Bob and I have actually done this analysis, where you know you look at the uh, you look at the city or the state that people are from, and if they're from a city or a state that doesn't have a large public transportation infrastructure, they tend to be dissatisfied with the bus service. And if you're from um, a, a place that has mass transit, you think it's fine. Um, the and so that's interesting. Uh, we you, know, you try and tell people that 16 minutes is a, is good to wait for the bus, and if they're used to driving everywhere, you know, just getting in the car and going, it's 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 not good for them. Um, but the interesting thing is, I don't know what Disney could do to improve that, right. because you know, to have a bus show up every five minutes, you would need you know triple the number of buses. But then that that congests the roads, you know, so you need even more buses, or you need special bus lanes, or you need to do um, you know, other infrastructure improvements, or you need to start restricting road access. It just gets, it gets super complicated. So the, the bus service is about as good as it can get, I think, based on the data. And I think that's something that, that, that people don't look at a lot. You, by the way, you notice the, uh, the bus lanes that they've added now on Buena Vista Drive coming from Disney Springs. Yes. Yeah. Through the middle. Going, yep. That's genius. Yeah. And you see the new, see the new flyovers that they're adding, that they've added to Magic Kingdom. Oh yeah. And it'll soon be this. That I mean, the Disney transportation has just been killing it lately. They've been just doing fantastic stuff. The gondolas, the self-driving cars, the bus lanes. It's yeah. The, it's, the mid, I mean, it, I know it's twenty bucks, but even the minivan service and well, the advantage of that is if you're going to Hoop to Do, they will drop you off at Pioneer Hall. Oh, that's big. That'll save you. Yeah, that'll oh, save you yeah. most of your night right there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's huge right there. So that's yeah, you know, that's that stuff where. The transportation department has just been doing so well over the last couple of years, and I don't think they get nearly as much credit because it's not glamorous, right? It's not a new yeah. attraction or anything. But but whoever is running the transportation department is just doing so well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And if you had that transportation department in a city, so Jeremy and I both live in St. Augustine, so we're outside Jacksonville, and mm-hmm. you, you know, ninety five. I mean, if Disney can fix it, it would have, or even I four through Orlando, oh, right? Geez. It, it would have yeah, put that you would, you would, yeah, you, would, you would like to think that that would have been done roughly fifteen years ago, but or mm-hmm. or longer. Here's here's my two things on bus. Going back to that. So I usually don't have a problem with the weight. My two issues always with the bus are if you stay at a resort that has that's large with many bus stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you start going and you're at Old Key West and there's seven bus stops or you, you know, you're at Saratoga Springs and there's five bus stops. Right. Right. There's just so many that it's just it's like, wait a minute. I pat I literally when we stayed at Old Key West, we got on at the community hall. We were in building, I forget what it was, 63 or 65, which is the building right across from the community hall. Mm-hmm. We passed our building, I think, three times yeah. before we got to back to our stop. Um, so it's not that. My biggest concern, so one, that that's one thing. So 16 minutes, yes, it's just with all those stops within um, it's a true. resort. Yeah. My second thing has more to do with humanity. <laughs> yeah. And people, and, and again, there, there's, there's having manners, and there's just being completely oblivious. Such as, there's not a lot of seats on those bus. I got a seat. I am a forty-year-old Mister Universe and the most fit person in the world. I'm sorry that you're carrying a child. I'm sorry that you're doing what you stand because I claim my seat. So really, my my Disney bus has less to do with Disney and more to do with humanity. <laughs> yeah, I've seen I've seen behavior on Disney buses that would get you cut in New York City. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> like there's 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 behavior on Disney buses that would not would not fly in a New York subway at all. Like there's a there are rules, man. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, and we're not advocating yeah, that, but if it hel- <laughs> if it helps, <laughs> yeah, use, use your manners and and yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the the signs I think you know for the for the elderly or you know the guy who's carrying a um, forty five pound child at. 12 in the morning after being at magic yeah. kingdom all day. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's some the of thing. That. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have some empathy, right? I mean, we've all been there. We've all carried kids and you know, we all know what it's like and you know, giving up your seat isn't the worst thing in the, uh, in the world. No. I think, uh, I think that's fine. Yeah. But I think the, you know, in general, I think the bus services aren't about as well as, uh, as they could. I still, uh, I still drive, uh, to most parks except for the magic kingdom. Yeah. I, uh, I do like, um, using Uber to get dropped off at the contemporary for the magic kingdom now. Mm-hmm. So yes, 
uh, I'm, I'm willing to spend the, uh, you know, the, the eight bucks or whatever for the, uh, for the ride, just because I, I don't want to use the TDC and I don't want to walk. That's if I'm staying off site. Yeah. Um, I still think that's, that's super useful, but yeah, I think in general it's, it's going well. I think, um, you know, the, the new security stuff is good. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens with star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's a lot of that infrastructure now that they're putting in with all the road work. I can't oh, even imagine man. what it's going to look like. Um, Have you driven into Toy Story Land recently? Yeah, I, did, I just did uh, Friday. I, I headed down to check out the new Star Tour scenes. I mean, there's Is, there's two security booths to get you in. There's two security booths, yeah. but how about that, that merge where it's like, bear left, yes. bear right. Yeah. No, wait, not that right, the other right lane. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I went two consecutive. Uh, I, I went a Thursday, and then I went down the following Friday and went straight to Hollywood Studios. And and both times I was glued um, to Waze just to make yeah. sure that I was going the right direction. Because the yeah, first exactly. time I almost turned into Bonnet Creek, and then I think I can't remember what I did the next time. But the next time you're like, oh, I'm, oh, never mind. I, I took the ramp. I'm going to right. Animal Kingdom now. Yes. Okay, sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. 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 So there, there's going to be a lot of, of of fixing up to do with that prior to uh, you know somewhat Toy Story Land, but definitely when Galaxy's Edge opens. Did yeah. you see the uh, the size of the parking lot expansion that they're doing over yeah. there, though? Yeah, it's insane. I, where are they going to put those people? I, don't I mean, know. it's great that they've you know that they've expanded the parking lot by fifty percent, but but what are these people going to ride? This, yeah, there's only going to be when Galaxy's Edge opens, there will only be a total of four new four new rides. Yeah, and then, well, I mean, I wonder is there any chance you know knowing that that there's going to be the Star Wars themed hotel eventually that should have its own entrance to Galaxy's Edge? I wonder if they open a secondary entrance. Once Galaxy's Edge opens, because still, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that uh, uh, the current situation being able to handle the influx. I mean, it's going to be, right. it's going to be beyond anything they saw with Pandora. I mean, it's going to be, oh, yeah, 10, yeah, yeah. Pand- 10 to 100 be, times like, that. Yeah, it'll be more like, like Harry Potter at Universal yeah. when it first opened and there are nine hour waits to get in where, yeah, if you want to get into the park, you show up at midnight right. the day before. <laughs> it, it, no, I, I honestly believe it would be like that. I think people will will line up literally as soon as Disney lets them. And if they if Disney lets people camp overnight, you know, for the first month, then then people will camp overnight for it. I I have no doubt. Yeah, that it's just it is interesting. That I guess that goes back to I guess I'll be happy for the first uh, six nine months getting my uh, Beauty and the Beast fast pass. <laughs> yeah, right. if you have a fall, yeah, you've got the fall back there. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Would yeah. you like to see Muppets again? Would you like to see Muppets? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, man, Lynn, I mean, this, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, John and I are so thankful, you know, you you agreed to, to come on the show. Obviously, you're still answering emails because uh, you answered yeah. ours pretty quickly and agreed to come on our show, which, you know, we, we appreciate so very much. Um, I think everybody knows to, to check out touringplans.com, but do you want to share just overall, where else you know they can find touring plans on social media? Where they can find you on social media if, if you'd like them to, and sure. uh, what 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 they should do to take the best advantage of touring plans? Sure. So uh, so touring plans is at touring plans on uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, pretty much every other piece of social media. I'm at Len Testa uh, on Twitter. Uh, I don't use uh, Facebook. Um, yeah, but if uh, go check out the site uh, touringplans.com. Like I said, the uh, the touring plan software itself that uh, builds your itinerary and routes you through the park uh, throughout the day, that's free. Uh, some of the other stuff costs money, but uh, we do have money back guarantees. So, uh, you know, there's a no risk uh, thing to try it out. And uh, if you have any questions on it, uh, send me an email, len at touringplans.com. And, and again, you're taking a, a, for most people, right? It's not Jeremy and I who are there regularly, even though we gladly spend the, the $15, yeah. but you're taking your family, you're taking a trip and it's a few thousand dollars. The, the 15 or 20, whatever it costs you, um, there is nothing more invaluable to, um, to go ahead and subscribe and take advantage okay. of the service. So yeah. big fans of it. Too. Yeah. And, and I can tell you, even a lot of times I end up using it cause I'll plan out my entire day and I'll input my fast passes. And sometimes I just use it as a checklist you know, and I know I go ahead and hit done when I when we've done that ride or attraction or, or show or we've eaten dinner. And, you know, I can go even go back and look. I've used it at least a dozen times, you know, because we use it once a month over the past year. Just recently, I started looking back at 2017 and I could still go in and kind of see where we were on what days of our trip and yeah. what we actually did and accomplished. So even there, to me, is worth 15 bucks if I didn't take advantage of everything else, but you know, most of the time I do take advantage. So again, thank you so Thanks. much, Lynn. Uh, we, yeah, we look forward to seeing what you guys continue to come up with. Uh, I think that's all we got for right now. So yeah. we'll see you real soon.